Yamaha flugelhorns never fail to excite me, but today I am particularly excited because we are not just talking about an ordinary run-of-the-mill Yamaha flugelhorn. No, this is a discontinued model that has been out of production for several decades and is very hard to find nowadays. Stay tuned. How's it going everybody? It's Sam here from the Samuel Plays Brass channel. I appreciate you tuning in today and I hope you're all doing well. We've got a very special review coming up and I know I say that a lot, but I'm not blowing any smoke today because this is indeed a very special instrument that you don't see too often that I was really, really impressed by. So without any further ado, the Yamaha YFH 635ST. We'll now dive in and take a closer look at the Yamaha 635 Flugel. This is a really beautiful instrument. We'll see it's the 635S variant because of this beautiful silver plate. It's aged very well and we just gave it a polish here at Clearwater, which is why I've got these marching band gloves on. But in any case, we know this is a very old Yamaha because it doesn't have the Yamaha logo on the bell anywhere. The bell is just a clean slate, which I find kind of funny about these older Yamahas. Where you do find the logo is on the lead pipe there. You get the tuning fork logo in Yamaha, Japan. It's got a standard uh, screw to adjust the lead pipe for tuning on the instrument. We've got a lyre holder coming out of the valve section and three water keys on the instrument, one on the main branch, one on the third slide, and one on the first slide. The third slide has a trigger, so it's the ST variant. But the trouble is, it's not quite the fastest right now, and the paddle is tiny. That paddle, when I hold the instrument, is only really being operated by, of all the things, my left hand ring finger, probably my weakest of the 10 digits. And so that's really suboptimal at the moment. I suppose you could get a larger paddle fitted onto that if you wanted, uh, and I probably would were I to own this instrument. Anyway, there aren't a ton of necessarily striking features about the Yamaha 635 ST, but it's definitely a really cool horn, and I wanted to show off some of its beauty here. Back to you, Studio Sam. At first glance, or rather first Google, I suppose, the 635 seemed like a pretty well-kept secret. I could not find nearly the same wealth of knowledge online about it as I had been able to prior about the Model 631, which is its more common cousin. I've actually reviewed the Model 631, you can find that up in the card. But nonetheless, as far as the 635 went, the trail was running cold fast. There was no mention of it either in Yamaha's official log of discontinued models, or in the unofficial external reference that I tend to use on Trumpet History, because it seems to just have all the models and specs just succinctly listed right there, except for the 635, and that was really frustrating. The most I could find online initially about the 635 was a few forum posts on Trumpet Herald, where it seems that some pros of the Trumpet Sphere kind of quietly swear by it, and nobody else really seems to know about it. That was unsatisfying. Eventually, I stumbled upon a resource that let me know that the 635 was actually the predecessor to, and was later developed into, the Model 6310, which is different from the 631. I know, it only gets more confusing from here, but you can find the 6310 also up in the card. And what you might know is actually the more common 8310Z, which was Bobby Shue's flugelhorn. So the 6310 was sort of the early manifestation of the Bobby Shue design, and then the 8310 came after that. I actually play on the trumpet variant of the 8310. It's right there. It's Bobby Shue's trumpet. I really enjoy it. But nonetheless, as far as the 635 flugel goes, not a ton of information, but that finally gave me something to work with there. I also ended up finding out that the 635 is based on early Queen on and French Besson flugel horns, which tend to sound a little bit more diffuse and soft in nature than some modern flugel horns on the market. But nonetheless, the 635 was built on that small French bore of 0.413 inches, as opposed to the 631 and 731 bore, which is 0.433, or sort of a medium bore in the flugel horn market. The 635 also has a 6 inch bell flare, and the bell is made from yellow brass, although I shudder to think how dark it would sound with a rose brass flare. And one key difference from the Queen Anne and French Besson models is that it does not have a Euro taper shank. The shank on this instrument is a standard large US Morse taper, and in fact, it is one of the largest tapers you'll find on the market. Yamaha lead pipes swallow their mouthpieces. It's weird, but that's just a feature of Yamaha's. As is typical of higher end Yamaha flugelhorns, the 635 is just stupidly easy to play. It's a very agreeable instrument as far as flugelhorns go. You can just hand the reins off to it and it pretty much does the work for you. 
I found myself having to corral it a fair bit less than the 631 I reviewed, even though I really enjoyed the 631. And something I found is that the intonation is on par with what you would expect of an upper-end Yamaha flugelhorn, but, once again, maybe about 10% better than the 631. And my theory here, of course I could be wrong, is that that 413 bore of the 635, as opposed to the larger 433 of the 631, actually helps in this regard. Because some of the most disagreeable flugelhorns I've played have been the ones designed on basically trumpet-sized valve blocks, you know, 450 and 460 bores. And so 413 is kind of on the other side of the spectrum, and I found that the intonation of the 635 was actually very agreeable. Flugelhorns are notoriously tricky when it comes to range, at least compared to playing the trumpet, whereas you might have three comfortable octaves on the trumpet, with a lot of flugelhorns you'll find that you have two comfortable octaves. A lot of the time it's kind of like low G to high G, or on some, low C to high C if they're a little bit foggy in the low range but open up, up high. The 635, all the way from low F sharp to high D or E, is just totally on lock basically three comfortable octaves. The fact that it has that wide open high register that the 631 had, without sacrificing the low notes, that's really serious business right there. All the way down to the pedal tones even, it's just great. But if you think I'm done gushing about the Model 635, you would be sorely mistaken. Its strongest aspect is not the fact that it has good intonation or the fact that it feels great over almost three octaves, it is the fact that the 635 has the deepest, richest, warmest, fluffiest sound out of, I think, any flugelhorn I've tried up to this point. I think it even edges out the 6310, which should, by all accounts, be the same thing. But I swear there's something about all these old discontinued Yamaha models that just cannot be matched by anyone on the modern market. This horn has a sound that's very evocative of those French flugelhorns like the French Bessons and Quinons and Courtois and whatnot, without all those annoying symptoms of vintage horns such as the poor valve compression and foggy slotting and terrible intonation. It combines the Yamaha playability with that really desirable sound. That small 413 bore allows for a more conical bell section, which contributes to that really smoky and diffuse quality in the sound. The one thing to watch out for is that the 635 is not going to project nearly as well as something like the 631 or the 731 with their bigger bores, and Yamaha fully admits that the 631 and 731 were designed for things like big band use so that you can really soar over a band in a jazz setting. Whereas with the 635, I think its best uses would be playing with a vocalist or playing in a small jazz combo setting or a recording situation where you can crank the gain up as much as you need to, but you just really want to focus on that nice velvety sort of tone quality.
I'm aware that the 635 isn't for everybody. I think a lot of people wouldn't find it to be their cup of tea for jazz band or brass band settings and would say that it doesn't project super well. And that's probably part of why we don't see nearly as many 635s floating around as we do 631s and 731s. But for jazz combo or for matching the same subtlety of tone of non-brass instrumentalists or vocalists, I really can hardly think of anything better than the 635. Like I said, I've played the 6310, I play that Austin Custom Brass Doublers model to my right fairly frequently, and yet the 635, specifically, is just imbued with some sort of special sauce. It really has stuck with me in the months since I filmed that the, the playing segment of this review. I've really enjoyed doing this review and I hope you have as well. In any case, until next time, you can find more instrument reviews in the top right corner in the card, and we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks for watching everybody. If you want to support the creation of bigger and better content on the Samuel Plays Brass channel, have your name featured right here, and a whole host of other perks and benefits, then please consider pledging your support at patreon.com slash samuelplaysbrass. For now, you can find more videos in the end screen cards to my left.